uh, it's not what I can do for better results, but I want better results for me from the physicists. So we shall be studying the exclusion process, which is really integrable and which can be used and analyzed to get some results of physics. And there are quite a few. So again, this is not really working today. No, it's working. So according to the geometry of the problem, the techniques that are used, uh, they are all akin to beta ansatz or related to beta ansatz, but they can be slightly different. So there will be three main parts in this talk. Is up on the ring, coordinate beta ansatz. Is up with open boundaries, matrix ansatz. I won't say much. Eric is going to give a talk about that next week. So we just mentioned the technique. And I would like to spend more time on the third part, which is ASA for me, and using some more recent techniques related to integrable probabilities. Probably many of you, of you know about it, but I want to, to tell about it. It's quite beautiful. Again, same picture. And uh, so to try to model this wire connecting two reservoirs at different potentials, temperatures, the idea is to, to start with a caricature model that looks like a caricature which is reaching out to, of course, to, to, to entertain us for almost lifelong research. And this model, which I represented here on a finite segment of size L, consists of discrete sites, particles on sites. It's a continuous time model. Each particle can jump to the right with rate one, so quality dt, to turn t and t plus dt, with backwards uh, with rate q, so q dt is probability of jumping backwards. But of course, jumps in which uh, a particle tries to go to a site which is already occupied are forbidden. And you can connect your system to two reservoirs on the left and on the right. A particle can be injected with priority alpha dt on the first site if it's empty. The first site can be emptied if it's occupied by a particle with priority gamma dt. And mutatis mutandis on the right. So these are the rules. I want it to be very specific. And again, I said it the other day, this was in fact invented by biophysicists who wanted to understand the transcription of NRA into proteins. This is a true picture, picture C, is a true picture of transcription factors traveling along RNA, reading the codons, reading the genetic code, and assembling the protein according to the genetic code, the amino acids. So it's a true picture. And this is really the origin, the birth of the exclusion process. And then, of course, it was uh, studied a lot by mathematicians uh, and other, we should mention later. And it was also very much to interest to physicists because uh, this is a minimal model, like the Ising model. So it appears in solid state physics, in models of polymers, and also in surface growth. So this is, I learned yesterday from Sylvie that this is called a Maya, Maya diagram. For me, Maya was a B, but it's also a diagram. Yeah, just a joke for French. <laughs> I used to see a, a French program called Maya the Bee. Anyway, so you can represent uh, you can represent uh, your exclusion process with particle and holes as a slanted interface. Uh, sites which are occupied in half integers correspond to downward slope. Sites which are empty correspond to upward slope. And if you look at the jump of a particle, which is created here by rate one, it, it's the same thing as depositing a brick on the interface. So the interface grows and evaporates and can be translated into the, the equivalent to the dynamics of these particles of, of this one dimension like this. And one major source of interest is that dynamics of interfaces are supposed to be modeled in the scaling limit of large size and large times by a universal equation known as the Cardar Parisian equation, which is written here in red. Not, uh... <laughs> Seems to be funny. Okay. <laughs> so the Cardar Parisian equation was written in the 80s, 86, by Cardar Parisi and Zong as a kind of normal form for surface growth, respecting some symmetries and some kind of scaling argument. You don't have higher order terms because they will be irrelevant in the scaling limit, so you don't need them. This is a minimal model. And the exclusion process is a discrete version of the GPC equation. So many results in 1D 
which will open for chain for KPZ or in fact obtain through the solutions. Yes, and this is quite non trivial, but yeah, they are related to the the correspondence was not so trivial to understand. And as you know, also this KPC equation for us physicists, we can just write it like that. But of course, it's a nice way of mathematician. It's a nonlinear, high order, uh, stochastic PDP. And it's really the work of people who uh, establish the existence of these kind of objects from the mathematical point of view. There are some infinites which are normalization, which is hidden there. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> okay, anyway, so my seminar is, oh, is finished. Um, and I'm going backwards. As I told you, different geometries result in different phenomena and also in different techniques to address them. The simplest geometry is the ring. So if you have exclusion process on a ring that you always read in the trigonometric direction, so forward is really anti clockwise So you can have jumps with P and Q. And the asymmetry of the jump breaks the gel balance and keeps the model out of equilibrium. You can have the infinite line, which is uh, with the third part of the, of the top. Or you can have the, let's say, the original system that was studied by the physicists in the 90s, which is the finite system with reservoir, which is the closest to the picture we want to, to describe. But maybe not the most interesting from the mathematical point of view. So the technique used to study these models are diverse. They all imply integrability, but in different uh, point of view. Let's start by the simplest one, the exclusion process on a ring. So coordinate better on that. So the particle jumps forward at bridge one, backward with bridge Q. They are binomial L, L is the number of site, N, the number of particle. Binomial LN is the number of configurations. And Q is the asymmetry parameter. As I told you yesterday, there's a Markov equation with a line, this, uh, this uh, stochastic, simple stochastic process. And you can, of course, uh, specify the state of the system by just giving the position of the n particles, x1, x1, xn. So you have an equation, dpdt, is the Markov matrix multiplied by p. And the miracle seems trivial now because we know it for 30 years, but the first person to realize it was Lee Bagdar in the end of the 80s, and then it was developed further by Guat Bushborn in the 90s, is that this Markov matrix is nothing but a spin chain. It's made of local operators or update updates of the, just a link, a bond between i and i plus one. So it's a two by two matrix, which tells you how a bond which has four states can involve. And this two by two matrix is nothing but an x, x, z spin chain that you can write using Pauli matrices S plus, S minus, et cetera. And realizing that uh, was the beginning, opening the Pandora box of integrability of this system. So it was a very important observation by Deepak Dar, who never wrote a paper. He wrote a four line paper, a non four line paper, a four line abstract, and said that he was able to compute the cap, the, the dynamic exponent, using that on that, never gave any detail. And uh, details and much more came much later by Guan Shipo. And it was quite technical. So I have a question. So you, you use the word integrable. So here, what can you, can you say what you mean by integrable about this animation? Yeah, so it's in fact, you can twist it a bit and make, put it into XXZ. Okay. And once you have XXZ, it's like okay. so just a little more. story. So Dark was the first to, to suggest that so. it was connected to KPZ or? Uh, no, no, this, no, I don't think so. I think it's Robin Boyle, who saw the relation. Because Robin Boyle, the student of Sunday Dwarfs. So. so this was more, you know, KPZ was more surface science. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's of course related to RSOS models that Deepak Dar was studying at that time. And so, okay, not completely sure what he's doing. But once you see that thing, you can really work on it using better on that. Trivial remarks, the stationary state is uh, flat. Every configuration is at the same uh, probability. So you don't need better on that stationary state. So just one over the binomial. So the density profile is flat on average with Gaussian fluctuations. All this is very simple, just playing with binomials. You don't need better on that for that. But as soon as you want to know about excited states, 
that convergence to stationarity, then you need to know the eigenstates of your Markov matrix N. And the best way to accept to go to these eigenstates is through that. Um, for example, one object we want to study, as always, because the system is out of equilibrium, there's a non vanishing current to the system. Cars are going around the system. You want to know the statistical properties of this current, the averages, yeah? If you want to know the variance, you want to know the large initial function, as I try to convince you. And for that, you really need to go into the whole matrix, not only the stationary. So, just one line, because of course, I think people are very much familiar with that. Uh, you can solve this model by using coordinate vector that, which means that you can look for the eigenstates of your matrix M as a linear combination of plane waves with well chosen amplitudes, these A sigmas. And because particle, this is again hand waving, but bounce against each other, you have to somewhat make a sum over all permutations possible, factorial and permutations of these plane waves. And you can show, because the system is integrable, that indeed a psi given by this better on that um, can be an eigenstate of your Markov matrix under the condition that the Zs, which are the wave vectors of the wave numbers, uh, with gas cities, compared as you like, uh, satisfy this bunch of polynomial equations, uh, which couple them with each other. So this looks a bit horrible, but this is much simpler for the non-aficionados than solving the characteristic equation, the Hamilton, Kelly Hamilton equation of your problem, because your matrix is of size two to the power L. So this will lead to a polynomial of two to the power L degree. And this is only a polynomial of degree, let's say, two L. Couple of polynomials, but even in a computer, you can solve exactly, exactly. By mathematical, you can get the solutions of these equations up to size 100. You're not going to diagonalize a matrix with two to the power. Okay. So it's already a, a huge reduction of complexity. And once you're able to solve the Z's, you can compute the eigenvalues through the formula given at the end of the, of the slide, summing the Z's and the one over Z's. So X. X, oh, sorry. Oh, pardon. I'm mixing notation with Q. Oh, pardon, pardon, pardon. Sorry. Yeah, tendency. So thank you, Stefan. Q is X. Sometimes it's Q, sometimes it's X. By the way, when Q is equal to one, symmetric exclusion process, you are really defensive. So this is a better on that for which they invented the answer. That's X, 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 So symmetric exclusion process on the ring is nothing but raising that in imaginary term. Oh, no, 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 it's not possible. Okay. So yeah, I'm sorry, X is Q, I should correct that, absolutely. So in the case of totally asymmetric, Q of X is equal to zero, particles only jump in one direction. There's a little miracle. These better equations decouple. If you put X equal to zero, you will see that they don't become trivial. They don't become trivial, but they become much simpler. The quadratic terms disappear. And you can write these equations as a single polynomial equation of degree typically 2L, uh, and this polynomial, the roots of this polynomial are the beta roots. <coughs> so it becomes a one moving problem that you can solve quite explicitly, even in finite size, usually better on that, you have to go to an infinite size limit and do some integral equation, in a rough and so on. But here, you can even go to finite size and you can even study the geometry of the beta roots. They align with some very nice curves Cassini ovals, which are generalization of the Lenin scat, Bernoulli Lenin scat. And you can really play with them the way they move, the way, the, the way they, their geometry changes when you change the density of some parameter in the system. And you can really do the analysis uh, very uh, precisely and for finite systems. You, do, you can do a kind of combinatorial analysis, which is embodied in this cryptic picture, but which contains a lot. So they are the better roots. Uh, this is because I don't know how to draw the capital small z's on my x figure, but they represent these small z's. They are the same. Sorry. So each curve corresponds to a different eigenvalue? Uh, no, the choice of the z's on different curves corresponds to a different eigenvalue. 
and the size of the of the curve uh, corresponds essentially on your different densities of the system and over there you have more particles so the size of the curves yeah um yeah more or less okay but doing this more precisely you can for example compute the gap of your system and computing the gap tells you that your the first excited state so you know that of course the ground state is zero it's not considered the first excited state which has a negative real part it tells you how the system relaxes uh, to your stationary state and the relaxation of the system is in one over the size to the power of clear root so it's not a diffusive system the diffusive system is one over l square it's one to the l to the power three over two and this three over two is an exponent for kpz it's called the dynamical exponent of kpz so this is an exact calculation done by da i mean announced by da and done then by Bosch and kim of this uh, exponent so this is maybe the first uh, example in, the, in that field in that subfield of the use of the better results to get an exact exponent related to the Carnot particle, the dynamical exponent and as i told you yesterday it's a system which is out of equilibrium so the Markov matrix is not conjugate to Hermitian. Okay, it's not a Hermitian matrix up to some conjugation. So it, its eigenvalues have imaginary parts. So there is some underlying oscillation. So there are some correlations and oscillations in the dynamics of the system. It's not just relaxing by pure, uh, pure exponential. There are some cost and signs. And these oscillations, physically, they mean that there are some waves in the system, some traveling waves. And these waves were studied, for example, by uh, Mustantir Barba, uh, Satya Majumda, Paul Kravitsky, and other people. Not through better answers. Once the better answers told you that there are waves, they use some kind of phenomenological approach to study these waves in correlations. Now I want to emphasize something which I find very impressive and quite important, is that this is really the case, in the case of TASA, for finite system, where you can do the full better transverse analysis. What I mean is that you can take an initial state, get the complete spectrum of the system, the complete, not only the upper state, full spectrum by better transverse. And not only the eigenvalues, but also the eigenvectors. So get formulas for your coefficients, as sigmas, get formulas for the normalization, the norm of the better states, and decompose an initial state into this eigenbasis. This eigenbasis is an eigenbasis which evolves trivially. So you can evolve it for a finite time and then do the better on that synthesis, resum the better on that, like you do with Fourier, for example, and get the, the shape of the probability distribution at any finite time. This is absolutely incredible. I don't know if there are many examples where the full better on that program can be carried out fully, completely. Uh, to the end. And this was done in a series of work by Sylvain Prola from Toulouse. It really took him many years, I mean, to do the combinatories of these better states, the combinatories of these roots that you choose, that you remove, and then you have all these holes and all the, all the game that people know in better than us. He could do it fully and get uh, exact results at finite time as well as asymptotics. And in fact, get results for KPC by going to large science system limits. And also more recently, he studied two years ago and he's still working on that. He showed that these kind of pictures here, in fact, in which you have these better roots that move on curves and so on. This is just a kind of uh, wrong image. It's a nice image, but in fact, it contains something which is much more rich. Say some Riemann surface, which is an image. You have a polynomial, you have roots, you choose roots. So of course you have a Riemann surface. Whenever you have a polynomial, you can build a Riemann surface. And he really understood, which I cannot explain to you, in fact, but we should ask him, that the Riemann surface image allows you to compute uh, some precise observables for this system. And he has developed a whole, uh, a whole theory around that, which, of course, the motivation is KPZ, of course. OK, so something I told you yesterday is that the total current is something we are very much interested in. If I call yt the total distance covered by all the particles on the ring between times zero and t, I want to study the characteristic function of this yt, 
the Laplace transform of this quality distribution. So the average of exponential mu yt. And in the long time limit, you can show that uh, this exponential mu yt behaves like exponential some coefficient e of mu times t. And e of mu is a cumulative generating function of your current <coughs> in the long time limit. And using the better results, uh, you can compute, in fact, a parametric representation of this e of mu. You cannot really compute e of mu, but you can represent e as a function of, as a series of some parameter b, and mu also as a series of b. So if you are able to eliminate formally b between these two uh, parametric expressions, you have e of mu. And this can be done at least order by order. So the nice thing is that, in fact, these uh, coefficients of these uh, parametric expansions, they are related to some combinatorial structures, tree structures that were also explored by Prolac more than 10 years ago. So the thing I want to emphasize is that, indeed, this, this can be computed by using better results equations, but not on the Markov matrix in some Duke transform and some twist of this Markov matrix. This goes back to Varadan, Donsker Varadan theory of large deviations, but essentially you have to slightly perturb, uh, perturb your Markov matrix and in such a way that fortunately it remains integrable and you can compute the cumulant of the currents. This was done by Derrida and Debovitz already a long time ago for TAZEP. TAZEP is a simple case, the better rules decouple. And then 10 years later, uh, Sylvain Prolac and myself, we did it in general for the ESA. So I want to tell you a bit about the results because the physics is hidden in the results. As, as you remember from yesterday, knowing the cumulant generating function allows you to compute a large deviation function. So you can compute the probability that the current yt divided by t equal to capital J takes some empirical value, which is not the average current. And this is embodied, encoded by the large deviation function phi of j. Phi of j is related, in fact, to this cumulant generating function by a Legendre transform. So once you know E of mu, you can deduce from that knowledge a large deviation function of the current. And you can get fairly explicit expressions uh, for, this, uh, cumulant gen for this large deviation function, explicit enough to draw it. So this is just an artistic sketch. I'm precise. You can do a precise drawing of this, cumulant of this large deviation function. And you can study the asymptotics. So here you have the typical current. Here you have the Gaussian fluctuations, the quadratic variance. But what we are interested in is an untypical behavior. So either very large currents or very negative currents. And as you can see, it's not a Gaussian, it's not a parabola. All this is in the exponent. So if it's a parabola, it would be a Gaussian uh, distribution. It's not Gaussian at all. And you can see from this sketch that in fact, the, this curve, grows much faster in the positive direction rather than in the negative direction. And this is quite intuitive. Here, if you, have to, if you want to have a smaller current than the typical current, if you want to reduce the flow through your system, in fact, you just have to need, you just need to have a few particles that don't jump easily, that become lazy. So it's easy to reduce the current in your system, only some for some statistical reason, you have some particles which jump, don't jump, so the current is reduced. On the contrary, if you want to create a huge current into the system, you have to push forward all the particles in your system. So they have to be very active, much more than they are on average. So it's much easier to reduce the total current rather than increasing it. And this is a kind of hand-weaving explanation of why this uh, large division function is non symmetric of course, it doesn't tell you about the exponents phi over two, three over two, and so on. This is not precise. And these exponents phi over two and three over two are also related to the KPZ world and so on. So all these things match well together quite nicely. If you want to do it on an infinite limit, So this is the limit of a finite interval when it goes to a very large size. But this is not the same thing as taking from the beginning, an infinite interval. Limits do not commute. I will come to it in the last part of my talk.
So, uh, but I'm going as usual very slowly. Uh, you can also study the weakly asymmetric case in which the system is quasi symmetric, but uh, the rate of jumping backward is one minus nu over L, where L is the size of the system. And this is something which is of interest for physicists mostly. So these are plots of the large division functions for different values of this asymmetry parameter nu. And what you can observe is that when nu goes over some critical value, the large deviation function develops a kink here. So breaking of analyticity. And if you remember, I tried to argue the previous days that large deviation functions are like free energies. And in thermodynamics or statistical physics of equilibrium, when free energies have something happening to their analytic behavior, it means that you have a phase transition. Well, the same feature is true far from equilibrium. If large deviation functions have a catastrophe in their analytic behavior, it means that the system undergoes something in the bulk. Something happens physically to the system. And here, it's quite simple because what happens, uh, the system, which is usually uniform in its typical state, if you want to force into it, in fact, not force, if you want to lower the current, because this is low, this is typical current, this is less than typical current, somehow you have to create an aggregate. You have to create a traffic channel. So instead of having the uniformly distributed density on your ring, you will have a kind of, you know, a bunch of particles which make an aggregate and make a traffic jam like with cars. And this kink in the, in the free energy, no, in the large deviation function of your system signals the appearance of this traffic jam, okay. of this condensation, if you want, just like having something that condenses. So you can probe phase transitions through the study of the analytic properties of your free, of your large deviation function, which plays a role in your free energy far from equilibrium. And this can be probed through microscopic calculations. Okay, I'm going to the second part, which is the system with reservoirs. So if there's any question on the ring, so the ring is not super exciting from the point of view of physics, I and mean, it's just you have no, it's, it's, it's a closed uh, um, road, uh, highway with no entries and no exits, okay. But it contains uh, methodology and some interesting phenomena anyway. More interesting is the open system, of course. Yes? Uh, so uh, oh, with the previous slide, so in the, after the king? Yeah. Uh, the slope tends to increase, but do you think that anything that it's harder to good question? Since you have traffic jam yes, yes, no, it's, it's a good question. Okay, I cannot reply like that. I would really have to think and not to reply something good. So I would have to think. Yeah, you're right. It's system, which is the closest to something more realistic with two reservoirs. So this is, of course, a landmark uh, paper by. Bernard Derrida, Martin Evans, Vincent Kim, and Vincent Pasquier, almost 30 years ago. This is a system with two to the power n microcontinuations. The dynamics is simple, which is described to you 10 minutes ago. But the weights of each configuration, the stationary weights, were not known till that time. Okay. So you have to find two to the power l probabilities that sum up to one. And that tell you what is the quality of observing this state in the session and state, or the state where there are no particles, whatever, one of the two to the power of states. And what these gentlemen uh, discovered 25 years ago, uh, um, was that you can represent uh, the, 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 the stationary probability as a product of matrices. Uh, and you have two matrices which encode for particles and, and uh, empty sites, D and E. Ask Vincent why it's called D and E, I don't know. Um, and D are for particles, E are for empty sites. For example, of course, a configuration is a binary string. So here, for example, this configuration I drew is E, D, E, D square, E, D, E, D, E, D. Okay. So you multiply these matrices. You compute one of the, the one one entry, let's say, some entry of this matrix, and this will give you the probability 
distribution in the stationary state under the condition that d e and the boundary vector and covector v and w satisfy this simple quadratic algebra. So I think this is essentially a guess, but because the stationary state is unique, you can check if it gives you the right stationary state. And once you have that, well, you have the atomic probabilities of the system. You know, because you, don't, the, you have the same thing as you would have from Boltzmann leaves. You know the probability of each micro configuration. So you can compute average current. You can compute the shape of the stationary densities. Can I just ask a question? Yes, of course. So, so since this beautiful guess, mm -hmm. is there any now algebraic understanding? Yes, of, why of course there is. is. And uh, I think Eric will probably tell more about that. Next week. Wait next week. Okay. <laughs> there were quite a few works, I think Sasamoto in the 90s, or, but really, I think it culminated a few years ago. Uh, and Nikolai, I think, really understood the relation of the average and something like that. But this is really Eric's, uh, Eric to tell you. But at least here, we have a tool to compute micro state probabilities. And so once you have that, we can carry out the program that I told you before. So first of all, it allows it allowed uh, very early to compute, of course, the phase diagram of the model. The phase diagram of the model depends on the reservoir densities. You push more particles. The reservoir on the right does not accept particles very easily, and of course, the high density state. It's quite familiar. You can compute finite size corrections. It is a huge amount of knowledge which has been developed thanks to this matrix on that. There's a review which was, which is still quite useful, but it would be nice if maybe Martin and Richard Blight could write another one. It's already 12, 15 years old, but it contains 100 pages, of many examples. The thing is that this matrix on that is not restricted to exclusion process. Many systems, which are variants of this exclusion process or generalizations can be addressed by using this type. So it has become a whole, uh, a whole sub subsubject working with that. But one thing that uh, this allowed uh, Derrida, Lebovitz, and Chanovs and uh, Spear to do is that, as I told you, we know the microscopic measure of this system. So we really know everything in the stationary state. So now we can ask ourselves what is the probability of, see of seeing a macroscopic profile like that, which is one of the main questions. So what is a macroscopic profile? Well, if you cut into boxes, you say, okay, I, I put boxes of size delta X, and in the first box, I put so many particles and so on and so on. A priori, you can imagine that it should be possible to do the calculation of computing in the large L limit, the probability of seeing any uh, profile shape. Yeah. It's a horribly complicated calculation, believe me. But in principle, you have all the information to, to do it. So it's a very, very difficult calculation. And this was done in the early 2000s by Derrida, Lebovitz, and Speer, who were able for this model to compute the probability distribution of any macroscopic profile, starting from the microscopic combinatorial measure. So it's terribly complicated combinatorics. And they were able to compute the free energy, non-equilibrium free energy of this profile. So I just flash on the on the on the formula. I mean, take half an hour to describe the details. Uh, you see, it's not the usual rho log rho one minus rho log one minus rho entropy formula. It's much more complicated. It's non-local because it relies on solving a non-linear uh, differential equation that is not solvable. So, but it's, at least it depends on some function which is non-local. And it's only in the equilibrium case when the two densities on the right and on the light are equal, then this formula reduces to what you hope it should be, which is just the Kramer entropy or the basic entropy of the system. But as soon as you are out of equilibrium, you get a free energy functional, uh, which is highly non trivial, which even has some complicated non convex behavior. But this was the first example. Of a free energy for us, I still let's call it free energy, although it's rather a large relation function of the profile. It's the first example of a non equilibrium free energy obtained from microscopic, from this matrix on that. Okay.
you, you wrote some that had kids q equals zero. Isn't q equal zero usually the combination? Uh, q equal to zero, that's the totally asymmetric case here. Yeah? Oh, okay, so sorry, so sorry, sorry. sorry. That's a totally asymmetric case. Sorry, I just forgot an A here. Totally asymmetric. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a huge mistake. Uh, yeah. Okay, something else that can be computed. So here in that open system, there are some current, of course, which is forced by the boundaries. And you can try to compute the statistics of the current. Not only the average, but the variance, the full probability distribution, the cumulant generating function, the large deviation function. We have insisted already enough in the first two lectures to show that this is the quantities we want to compute. Unfortunately, if you look at the current, it's the total number of particles that travel through the system between time zero and t. So it's not a stationary state, uh, a purely stationary state property. You really need to know the excited states of the system. So you cannot only use this measure to compute the, the fluctuations of the current. Okay. Um, unfortunately, so you really need to know more about your Markov matrix than just the above. It's remained a kind of open question for many, many years uh, to compute uh, the cumulant generating function or the large deviation function. I have really a problem with left and right theories. Okay, and this could, this was solved in the end. So I just, again, flash on the results, but just to show you that they are not too horrible looking. Okay, we have some formulas, parametric formulas for the cumulant generating function some simple formula for the, for the large deviation function. I just wanted to tell you that to obtain this result, and this is quite, uh, quite nice in fact. So this is something we developed with uh, Alexandre Lazarescu 10 years ago. Uh, what you need to know is to know some excited states of your matrix in some way. And what we use is a nested matrix ansatz. So the matrix ansatz I showed you before was just with two matrices D and E. And in the meanwhile, with some other collaborators, including Pazzo Ferrari, we realized that the M species exclusion that you told us about a couple of days ago can be solved by a kind of tensor product matrix ansatz. And this tensor product matrix ansatz also allows to solve the current the generating function problem. So, quite bizarrely, understanding what happens for the M is allows to understand what happens to the current in the open boundary system. I don't know the reason, but that's true. Stefan? So. Okay, so these are the results. And yeah, I, mean, uh, I would think, so it's not the same problem as computing exponential mu, uh, I mean, it's fine. I mean, the, the spectrum of the twisted. It is, it is indeed, yeah. yeah. That's what we did. So, so it should be a kind of better class. Well, as you know, well, you know, uh, that we solve it using the matrix on that. The problem is it's an open system. So the Bell on that calculation was completely completed. I, complicated, I think Nicola and we worked on that after, and that's also. But uh, I'm, personally, I don't even know if the Bell on that calculation was really carried to the end. Or yeah, just that's why I asked the question. Yeah, for me, I was happy with the result with this net, nested matrix on that. Uh, so it. It's taking this, uh, maybe what we heard this morning in the papers, is really taking this basic quadratic algebra of DNA and making tensor products. So, what we realize is that to solve the, uh, the two, part, the two, as I, the two species, we need the E and another matrix A. And for the three species, four species, if you can hold them up, you need to do some tensor products of these matrices. And if you want to have a five species, four species, even more than so products. So you can build a whole product of, of just D, E, and A? Essentially of D, E, and A, yes, essentially, with some deformations. Okay. So you can build more and more and more and more matrices and making these kinds of products in different orders. These kinds of E, and so on and so on, making them act on some formal space. And this solve the N species exclusion process on the ring. But fortunately, it also solves uh, the current human generating function. If you want to know the nth order cumulant of your current, you need the matrices that you use 
to solve the pairs and to solve the pairs to solve species exclusion. I don't know why, but it's true. It was a kind of, you know, a, a, a guess or a trial, and we were fortunate enough to get it out. It's full of mysteries. So let's come to the last part, uh, which is maybe more recent, much more recent, maybe more dear to me. So it's the infinite system. So it's AZ on Z. Um, and you put a part, number of particles on that, and you let your fluid on the line evolve. So there's one important piece of information that was first noticed by Schutz, remained unknown for 10 years until Tracy and Milan in 2008 really took it over and turned it into a real, you know, real machinery that works. Is that if you start with a finite number of particles, n, small n, initially located at x1, xn, you let your system evolve and you want to compute the probability that these particles are now at y1, yn. So you want to know this condition probability or green function, which is a kind of basic tool. If you know that, you know everything, you know all possible probabilities of evolution. And what Schutz noticed is that by using better ansatz as a kind of inspiration, not real better ansatz, there are no better equations, but using the better ansatz as a kind of formal right, way of writing things and writing a formula like that. So this formula is a integrals of n complex variables. And these n complex variables have to be integrated in some contours, small contours around zero. You put the typical part coming from the beta on that, these are the plane waves. And you put the form factors that you know from the finite beta on that. So this is again, you know, cooking. But if you take this formula and you forget about beta on that, you just write this formula and you sum over all permutations. This formula satisfies exactly the Markov generator in time t. So forget about beta on that, it's just a formula that you cook. And then once you have the formula, by unicity, you can check that this is a solution of the Markov equation. Beginning, as I told you, it remained almost unused and unknown for 10 years. But at least once you know the green function of that system, well, you can extract marginals. This contains too much information. And you could hope that you can compute some, you know, a, a given particle where it goes in the finite time, extract some asymptotics and so on and so on. But of course, uh, this is a horribly complicated object. You have a sum of permutations. There are factorial n permutations. n is the number of particles, should be a small n here. You want to go to the infinite size, it's an infinite size system, but you want to have an infinite number of particles. So you're summing over factorial n, which is already a big number with n going to infinity. So it's the combinatorics is horribly complicated. So it's more a visual, it remained more a visual thinking for many years to use that than really a tool. But it became a tool, and I want to show you how it, how it works. So, of course, to simplify that, there is full of combinatorial identities uh, between these rational functions. So, I want to show you how this works on one specific problem. But of course, this has become a whole, again, a sub branch, which is known as integral probability uh, techniques or theory. And uh, the, the great developers of this theory are people like. Bourdin, Corbin, Bichol, Agava, the students, it's a whole subject. So I want to illustrate that on some very specific uh, problem that we solved a couple of years ago with Sasamoto and Imamura to give you a kind of a flavor of how these techniques work for a practical problem. So one very practical problem is to take the exclusion process symmetric, symmetric P equal to Q equal to one on the infinite size system with a finite density now, infinite number of particles. And we take a particle, we look at a given particle, which was at zero at time t equal to zero. And we call x of t its position at time t. Of course, if the free random walkers would have intersect without any interaction, we know that x of t would go, x square of t would be linear in some diffusion. But because of this exclusion constraint, in fact, 
So this is a normal diffusion. <coughs> but because of the exclusion constraint, x squared grows only a square root of t. So the system has anomalously slow diffusion. X is typically of the order of t to the power one four. And that's an exact result that was obtained by Richard Aratia in the 80s. Exact asymptotic, of course, I ne never write that this should be the limit when t goes to infinity of this divided by square root of t is equal to the coefficient. That's what I mean. And the higher cumulants of this random variable, which is just the position of a given particle that you're looking at, and the full distribution and the large deviation function, they remain open for many years. Okay. So it's not solved. Uh, only the second cumulant, the variance was not. So let's put the system in slightly a more general setup. We want to put the particle at zero at time t equal to zero and start with the distribution of uh, densities. We put a low density, let's say rho minus on the left, a higher density rho plus on the right. The original problem was just uniform density. And we want to know the statistics of this, uh, this object. Okay. It's a particle which behaves like the others. It's only that we look at it. So if you just want to monitor, we could monitor a few of them, but let's say the simplest problem is just to uh, tag this particle and try to look what it does. So this is a problem that we solved uh, partially maybe five years ago and really fully last year. And uh, I'm quite proud of it, I just want to emphasize it. This is my only paper which contains the words theorem, lab, and so on. So it's, <laughs> math it's mathematically kosher. I'm not sure I will do any other one, but uh, it's in CMP and the proofs are full. So I think there is no there is there is no hole as far as we can say. Anyway, so I give you the result, and then I try to give you some flavor of the proofs and of the steps. So the result is fairly explicit. Uh, it's an exact result at finite time, not only a synthetic. So we know the distribution, the cumulative distribution of our tracer. We know the probability that this tracer is before position x, probability that x t is less than x. And this is given as an integral of a freedom determinant. So freedom determinant is a determinant of an operator. Uh, the operator is specified by its kernel. So the kernel is written here. And as you can see, it's very highly remindful of the form factors of the beta on that. It's coming from there. There are some parameter in the system which embodies some, the, the densities on the right and on the left and the integration variable. We'll tell you more about that. Um, and there is a little decoration. You have to multiply your uh, freedom determinant by some function, which again contains initial conditions. Okay, so it's a bit cryptic, but I just want to tell you that, so this variable omega really expresses some symmetries of the exclusion process parity and time also. This kernel is a form factor. And this function omega zero, W zero, carries this Poisson-like uh, boundary condition, rho plus and rho minus on both ends. And you have to make the integration around a small contour, a complex contour, it's a single variable here, around zero. And there are some poles and so on that you have to exclude, but uh, this is just a technique. So it's a fairly explicit result, at least for I mean, all this is a question of, you know, point of view, of course. Um, just a little word about freedom determinant. Uh, does everybody know about freedom determinant? Single? Okay, then it's very nice. It's a very nice object. It's a determinant of an uh, operator of infinite dimensional matrices. So the idea is the following. If I take a finite matrix, I have this exact expansion uh, of the determinant of the matrix, one plus omega k. This one, you know, of course, you know that first order is a trace. We all know that. But you can continue to higher orders by taking two by two minus, three by three minus, and so on and so on. So this is, this is an exercise for, uh, you know, second, second year university for a finite matrix, n by n. And the idea is, physicists are not going to put uh, norms and so on. These sums, when you go to an infinite size system, uh, you can transform them, them into integrals. And then this kind of formula, this expansion of the determinant allows you to compute the determinant of uh, many operators. The operators have to be trust class, essentially. So freedom operators, one plus omega k. So there's a whole theory, I mean, 
classical theory, you find that all these things rigorously in the functional analysis books of random determinants. And you can really view them as a generalization of our good old determinant for finite matrices. Uh, I'm going back as usual. How much time do I have? One more. One more. Within the minutes. Okay, so I will just tell you a bit about how you get this result and what you can do with it. Uh, first of all, we go back to this Maya, Maya diagram that Sylvie told us yesterday about, but in slightly different, instead of going downwards and upwards, I draw a Maya diagram uh, in which if you have no particles, you are just horizontal. And if you have one particle, you go upward. Slightly, so it's a twist, it's just a rotation of your Maya diagram, but it's useful. And this allows you to treat your configuration of the exclusion process into a height interface. And in fact, the, this interface evolves when particles drop, this interface evolves. <coughs> and you can see that the total height of the interface above any given point, n of x and t, here from n of zero and t, this height corresponds to the total current that has flown to this bound between time zero and t. All these things are non-trivial when you see them for the first time. If you spend 10, 15 minutes on them, then it becomes simple. There is no hidden wolf in that kind of definition. It's quite, it's quite uh, standard. Okay. And then the whole thing uh, relies on the fact, you see it's always very difficult to follow trees because it's moving. So it's an observable, it's not at the same place. It's much easier to look at some place, side zero, side one, and look at the current of the height over it, because this is a static course. This Maya diagram allows you to trade between a moving tracer observable into a fixed height observable. Simple trick, but very easy. So in fact, it's just like going from Euler to the Lagrange coordinates in higher dimensions. It's a bit simple. For discrete variables. And again, a little thinking because you don't have, so this is very simple, but if you try to, if I try to explain it, I always get confused. But the probability that the tracer has traveled further than a distance x using this Maya diagram is the same thing that the height at x is negative. Sorry. And the same thing the opposite way. Very simple just by using exclusion, but always very confusing when you want to explain to it, especially in a language which is not not your native language anyway. Okay, so if you know the statistics of the height, you can trade it back to the statistics of the tracer. Okay. So you don't lose any information. So that's what we are going to do. And the nice, is nicer result, much nicer looking than the previous one, is that the cumulant generating function of the height over x is really given by a Fredon determinant, multiplied by some function with the same ingredients that I showed you before. So in fact, this formula is obtained first, and then going back from n variable to x variable, making some integrals because there's a cumulative function, you get a formula more complicated than I wrote before. But the master formula is this. So how do we get that? So I will give you the strategy to get that. Um, so it takes uh, quite a few steps. Uh, first step, which may seem bizarre, but it happens often, uh, it's better to generalize a problem to solve it. So it's better to go from Z to AZ and to introduce jumping rates, P and Q, and not only one one. Everything in this TZ, not TZ, AZ, is embodied in the asymmetry parameter P over Q. That's something they call X, but it's star. Okay? Because you don't really care about the absolute value of P and Q. You really care on the ratio up to a time, time scale rescaling. So again, we have traded the moving tracer position to the local height variable. But unfortunately, now we have to compute these heights everywhere. There's no free lunch, okay? So we have now many variables which are not moving, but of course indexed by the position of the site. And one very difficult thing here, which is again another um, wall that you have to break through, is that we want really to consider a system with finite density density one half, let's say. So we have an infinite number of particles. So we cannot really use the Schutz type formulas 
which are only valid for n particles. Okay. If you want to compute the height over a given site, you really have to count all the particles that went through it, not only a finite number. And you don't know what this number is. So you need some trick to restore finiteness. Otherwise, you have to ma manipulate uh, formal things, which are infinite, and you don't know how to sum them and so on. And the trick exists, and it's a very, very beautiful trick. Uh, it's called duality. So this would require a full seminar almost. But, and this duality is only true for the asymmetric exclusion process, and you cannot use it for the symmetric case. So that's why we had to go to, to the asymmetric case with a tau. And usually you want to compute correlations. And duality tells you that if you try to compute this tau correlated correlator, so that's tau is the asymmetric parameter to the power of n height over x1, blah, 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 times tau n to the power of xn. So these are correlators. These are correlators in your infinite system. And these correlators in your infinite system satisfy the same equations as the exclusion process, asymmetric exclusion process, with only n particles. There's a duality between these correlators for the heights, tau deformed correlators for the heights, and particles located at x1, xn. Okay, maybe this has nothing to do, but something which I found striking the other day in one of the talks is that when you have, for example, these KDV or KP equations, and you look at the poles, solitons, which are finite, these poles satisfy calogero law. So something which is a kind of effective dynamics for these poles. Well, here what happens, I, I don't really know if there is any relation, is that if you try to look at these correlators in the infinite particle system, infinite size system, it behaves, it closes itself as a finite system dynamics. And then you can use Schutz Cassegrain formula, because now you're you have brought finiteness into your problem. So what is the origin, the origin of this duality? But the paper remained unknown for many years, shoots in the 90s, who saw that because we have these exclusion processes are nothing but q deformed spin chains. And these q deformed spin chains are UQ SL2 invariant. So there's a quantum group invariance of these spin chains. And this results on the fact that these correlators are finite, I have this good property. So it's really the quantum group invariance of the exclusion process, which tells you that this duality property, which allows you to restore compactness, finiteness. Okay, so then it's a question of taste. I mean, you can be happy with that. I was much more happy when more recently with Imamura and Sasamoto, we proved, we found a probabilistic proof of this fact, forgetting about the 2 sl 2 and so on, which is very beautiful. Okay, and just by using Poisson calculus, stochastic calculus, you start with these correlators and you prove by using stochastic calculus that they close, that they have nice equations. And, but the real, the real thing behind it is this quantum group invariance. So first step, you have to use this finiteness. That's the main part of the, of the calculation is that you can get an exact formula for these tau correlators. And this exact formula of these tau correlators can be expressed by an n-fold complex integral with the same form factors and uh, some better, better eigenvalues. So you will tell me, but what's the advantage uh, of this formula? So this formula is a complex integral around some contours, which are nested and so on and so on. But the miracle is that here you don't have any sum over sigma in here. You're not summing over the group of permutations. The sum is done. And the sum is done precisely by the nesting of the contours. Somehow, you're able to resum this better sum with these form factors, these A sigmas. You're able to contract all that into a single multiple complex integral, but with some bizarre condition on the contours. And if you try to denest these contours using Cauchy formula, you restore the sum over all the permutations. But this is a compact object that you can play with. Okay, and now, okay, this looks horrible when you see it, but you can very easily prove once you have the formula, you can prove 
that this satisfies the Markov equations for a finite number of particles. And the main ingredients are trivial. That's why I wrote them. The main ingredients are in fact formulas like that. That you can of course give to your kid to check. And this one too, this is just an arrangement of functions. Just some and it works. And just because of that, when you do, when you act on this big integral by the Markov operator, of course the Markov operator makes one particle jump forward, backwards, put some Q, put some, put, put some P, and does this kind of uh, manipulation inside your integral. And once you combine all that, you see that some of the residues uh, of your integral vanish and it gives you zero because there's no pole anymore. So you have some cancellation of poles and things go well together and it simplifies. So again, the nesting condition of the contours are absolutely uh, crucial. And I want to emphasize the fact that these contour integral formulas are inspired by the better results, but they are not the better results. There are no better equations. They are just exact. Okay, they are exact. They are a bit bizarre. When we don't know them. It looks a bit odd, but this is, I mean, this is totally kosher from the mathematical point of view. And there's no problem with complete, completeness and non-completeness. Uh, you just take the formula, you put it into the generator and it solves it. So happy with that. Uh, okay, and there, of course, this is just one possibility of use in these uh, techniques of integral probabilities. But as you probably, many of them, of you know, this has been, of course, used in many, many problems. Okay, uh, two more little details. Uh, manipulating these equations in some ways and so on and so on, you can get some recursion relations for these big contour formulas. I'm not going into the details, but in the end, you can really get to this freedom determinant. And maybe I'm insisting on that because I know that most of you are mathematicians. Uh, there is no lack of rigor in all this procedure. Every step is perfectly rigorous. There's no approximation. Okay. So it's not physics anymore. Anyway, once you have a freedom determinant, then comes another part of your work, which is analysis. Sorry, Nicola. Uh, so you have to, to do a symptotic analysis using synthetic methods and so on and so on. And you can extract the large deviation function and you can get formulas. So I'm just ending my talk by showing to you that this may look quite abstract, but in the end, of course, you can retrieve RTS result for the tracer, you can get the fourth order, you can get the sixth order, you can plot the large deviation function. Things can become concrete. This is not just, you know, formulas which are totally formal. You can get numbers from them. Uh, and another, another thing, which is just a conclusion, once you get this large deviation function, you can even check that your calculations are not totally wrong by checking the Galapati coin identity for the trace of large deviation function, which is satisfied. It doesn't mean that your calculation is correct, but if you don't, didn't have it, it would mean that it's wrong, okay? And one nice thing is that because of this galavati coin relation, as I told you yesterday, uh, galavati coin implies the Einstein and the Sager relations. And there was a very old paper by Pablo Ferrari, Sean Goldstein, and Joel Lebowitz in the 80s, where they proved that uh, the exclusion process, although it's an interacting particle system out of equilibrium, it does satisfy the Einstein relation. Well, because it satisfies Galavati coin, it does satisfy automatically Einstein. So it's a kind of reproof of their result using Galavati coin. I'm going to end. Well, this I'm not going to talk about, and that's all. Yes. Thank you very much. That's another nice experiment. Can talk about. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> So this they did this uh Lebovitz calculation for Tazet now. So they did it in fact for Tazet and Zagos. That's why I got to show you. I mean I mean an infinite interval. No, right. Yes, but my question is now uh, because you, you seem to say that there are new techniques that work for infinite interval. So is it is it known for, for Tazet the large deviation function? Uh not for Tazet. Because ta so yeah, in fact that's a very good question. This is what I want to talk tomorrow about. Um, here, we computed the probability distribution of profile for a typical current. What is the probability that uh, large deviation occurs? But I didn't tell you how this large deviation occurs. 
It just tells you to tell you the probability. But what is the optimal fluctuation that brings some non typical current? So you have a rare event, which is very rare. But to obtain this rare event, you need some stochastic evolution, which brings this rare event. Okay, you pass the current through a wire. I usually, instead of having the own current, I have something which is very non typical. And because of that, uh, the system has produced some non typical behavior, some fluctuation which is non typical. So what we computed is the probability of seeing this non-typical fluctuation, but we have not computed how this, what is the history of this non-typical fluctuation. A priori, this could be accessible by better results, but absolutely nobody knows how to do it. So to address this question, what is the optimal fluctuation so the, that generates the non-typical behavior? So, you know, it's a very rare event, but to appear, it is true, the least rare of a rare evolution. It's kind of optimal. So for this, you need to use another technique, which is known as the microscopic fluctuation theory, which is tomorrow's uh, subject. And using this microscopic fluctuation theory, you can compute this problem, but not using the better. Okay, so that's for the, Symmetric and the weakly symmetric case. Okay. For the TASEP, unfortunately, this macroscopic fluctuation theory does not really exist yet, although there are some proposals recently. So it's a copy theory. Okay. So the TASEP is easy, right? would be more easy. Yeah, but the problem is finiteness. Again, you have to use duality. And uh, yeah, we don't know because we don't, nobody knows yet. We just mean that it's not doable. The questions. Online, no questions. Okay, thank you thank very you. much.